Hosanna to the son of David. That's the prophecy of old we heard Daniela tell us. Hosanna to the son of Joseph. That's the prophecy that's come true. Hosanna to the son of Mary. The Christmas story continues. This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth, which is in Galilee. Jesus of Nazareth, child of Mary, Joseph, and God. Brother to many, teacher to even more, prophet to all. Trained as a carpenter, a fisherman on the weekends, a good Jewish boy, this is some of the portrait of the man we call Christ, which means Messiah. What's important to remember in all of this story, in all of this King and Messiah, and all of this, is that's what we call him. Jesus. Jesus, that very human child, born in a manger, who grew up in the synagogue, Jesus never calls himself Jesus Christ. Christ isn't his last name, and it's not an epithet he ever used. Christ is more of an honorific, a term of address, like some of you are elders or deacons. Many of you are misses or misters. Christ is a word that is ascribed to Jesus by others, and one that is so often in question. Now today is a day when we remember the Messiah and the mighty words and the mighty works of God in Christ. We sing of God's awesome power, of Christ's great deeds, and we use royal and colonial and patriarchal language that doesn't always ring true to our modern and democratic attempts at egalitarian ears. Ride on, King Jesus. We couldn't hear it any better than Celeste just gave it to us. And this is a wonderful bit of hope. It's a reminder of that day on that donkey, of another honorific that Jesus never claimed. King. He never claimed it. But it would be nailed above his head while he died in anguish on a cross. You remember the crowds in Jerusalem that day, they were abuzz when he rode into that city on a borrowed burrow, and they saw him as a sign that their redemption was near, that freedom was at hand and their liberation was assured. This, this, they shouted, this is the prophet Jesus. He comes from Nazareth, that backwater town that nobody knows whereabouts. It's in the middle of the country somewhere, but it's in Galilee. Also, nobody cares about Galilee. This is the prophet about whom all prophecy is written. The Gospel of Matthew, which is to say the Gospel most concerned with fulfilling Hebrew prophecy. The Gospel we heard this morning, it doesn't miss this point. This is the prophet, Matthew tells us. This is the subject of prophecy. The promise of God to God's people that in the fullness of God's time, a child would be born, a son has been given, and the governments will be upon his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, writes another prophecy, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And here, though, here today, the crowd simply call him the prophet, which means the one who sees and who speaks the truth. Now shortly, these cries of awe and wonder at the goodness of this prophet will turn to cries of abandonment and anguish. They'll turn to cries of crucify. The joyful crowd today will soon turn against him it's a story as old as time itself. His best friend will deny him three times. Is there anything worse than a friend who turns away? Another close friend's greed, his career or his political ambitions, he'll get the best of him. 
and he'll betray the group's secrets for 30 pieces of silver. What a loss. What a blow. Here he had been for three years, laboring and ministering and healing and walking and sweating and sleeping and eating and doing all the things that humans do when they are trying to change the world, given all away for 30 pieces of silver. And a best friend who couldn't keep it together for one lonely night. Others will remain silent or they'll slip away through the back door when they don't think anybody's looking. Cowards. Cowards they all are. Cowards perhaps we all are. Only a few women will stay by his side from this moment until all moments are done. Only a few women will stay with him. Only a few women brave enough to stay by his side. Only women who recognize him when Peter denies him. Only women faithful enough to see this through, to know that presence is a gift we give to death as well as to life. To the prophet Jesus, there will be some who will know him, some who will leave him, and only a few who will stay with him. Now for Sunday kinds of Christians, the shouts of Hosanna on Palm Sunday turn to the joy and the shouts of Alleluia on Easter Sunday almost by magic, as if the week itself had worn away the devastation. This is definitely a bit of editing that leaves out the trickier bits that Thursday sorts of Christians and Friday sorts of Christians observe in the coming week. You have heard it said that today marks the beginning of Holy Week, the most sacred of weeks in the Christian calendar. There are services appointed for each of the days this week that are long since forgotten by those of us in Reformed or Protestant ways. But whether we've forgotten them or not, I assure you that they will be prayed for you by those who observe the commandment to pray without ceasing more literally than we do. Masses will be said, Prayers will be offered, remembrances will be shared, incense will go up to God. The Last Supper will be celebrated again and again. This is a week when our faith meets the road, and the road leads, as all things do, to death. To death we go, and then, as the story continues, to know to life after death. But first, friends, to death. To the death of the prophet, Jesus of Nazareth. To our own deaths, too. Our own deaths with the prophet, Jesus of Galilee. Our service today is at this very moment shifting from Hosanna to crucify it is doing so because the earth continues to spin. Time moves on minute by minute. Betrayals and that heavy cross are hastening into view. Today's service does not stand alone, but comes as a box set, the greatest hits of our faith. What we begin this morning will not be done until a week from now when we join the women at the empty tomb. They will beat us there. And between here and there, there is some work that we all must do. There are prayers I implore you to say. There are remembrances that in life and in death we belong to God. A remembrance that, you know it, dust we are, and to dust we shall return. As we begin this sacred week, we will conclude today's service with a reading of scripture that stands at the helm of the word of God for the people of God. It is the great masthead that guides our ship. It is a beacon at night. It is an anchor in safe harbor. 
It is what takes us from here to there and then to more. With our palms still fresh in our hands today, we will soon still hear the story from here to there, told in the fullness of Matthew's community of all that they knew, a fullness we seldom get to hear in our own community. You know it is the custom of the church to parcel out Scripture into bite-sized chunks. We call them pericopes. They're digestible morsels, just enough to tell us what to think and to give a preacher enough to talk about and a Sunday school teacher a good craft project. We heard the Palm Sunday gospel just moments ago. And soon, soon we will hear the gospel of Holy Week. Complete and unabridged, ready for you, read by three of us, for all of us. As we prepare ourselves for the week ahead, I encourage you to settle in and to let these words about a prophet that we know as Jesus settle into your hearts. Let the story you hear be the guide for this week. And may the words of the prophet Jesus settle deep into you. Maybe from time to time when you remember, join the saints and the sinners across the globe who pray without ceasing and join your heart to theirs. And as you do, as we do, as each of us does, let us remember Jesus of Nazareth, Joseph's boy and Mary's pride. Holy one, promised one, whatever you call him, anointed and betrayed one, friend of sinners, lover of humanity, human child of eternal God. Settling in, this week offers an invitation, an island in time that you can transverse at your own pace and as you will do. The church will keep you company. The Spirit will guide you. This is the story of Jesus of Nazareth. And as you settle in and I invite you to stay seated. I invite you to turn in your hymnals to hymn number 93. And may this tune haunt you for the days ahead. <laughs> 